Person, and I'm glad you can join us tonight because we're going to meet a true leading lady, a leading lady of the world. She's a leader in everything she does, whether it is on the stage where she won a Tony Award, in nightclubs where she charms and delights audiences, in her books which are beautifully written, or on the floor of the United Nations where she is public delegate to the General Assembly. In her leading roles, we call her fabulously talented. In her United Nations role, we call her the Honorable Pearl Bailey, a leader, an innovator, a very special lady. We will meet Pearl Bailey right after these messages, so please stay right there. I'm Arlene Hurston, and we're back with my very special guest, Pearl Bailey. We're here at the United States Mission to the United Nations, where Pearl Bailey is a public delegate to the 42nd General Assembly of the United Nations. And she has us here today as her guest. Thank you very much. Well, there's only one thing wrong with this whole thing, that fabulous introduction and all of that. And uh, I guess I'll have to make a resolution on you because you forgot to mention a schoolgirl, <laughs> Georgetown, Hoya. You left it at Arlene. How could you? That's right. Well, you know, actually, I <laughs> planned on telling you because I know that you graduated from Georgetown University right. in 1985. That's right. With Pat Ewing. Well, he went to the Knicks. However, uh, he got the he makes the baskets. He got the money, and I make the baskets, but sewing wise. And uh, I got the high marks. <laughs> you sure did. Okay, that. you made the dean's list, and your average was three point three four two four. Never been to college in my life. Two dean's lists, and the dean's award. I don't even know. I still am trying to find out what that means, but. Um, Sounds awful good. <laughs> yeah. It sure does. And Georgetown University, I mean, hot university. You know, you are incredible because you yeah. are a graduate of Georgetown University, yeah. as we mentioned. You went all the way through. They gave you an honorary degree, I think, in 1978. Mm -hmm. And you said, I'm going to be a student. You went in as a freshman. That's right. Now, you dropped out of high school. And here you are, a graduate of Georgetown University. That's right. You are one of the world's foremost entertainers. You never had a singing lesson. You've written five books. You are Did a I public do all you're talking about? <laughs> okay. I hope so. You are a public delegate to yes. the General Assembly of the United Nations, which yes. is an incredible honor, and you have never held political office. Mm -hmm. These are, you know, just some of your achievements. Do you feel that Pearl Bailey has been specially blessed? I think all of us are specially blessed. It's what we do with our blessings. You know, um, uh, people say, uh, in fact, someone just said to me this morning, it's something I had spoken about in one of our meetings. And they said, oh, I said, you see, if you open up and, and, and come right out with things, and the young person said to me, not so young either, I'm trying to help my age, said, um, oh, but see, you can do that. I said, you can too. But I, I don't have the voice. I said, yes, you do. God gave it all of us. Maybe, it's, maybe it's what you mean is you don't have the guts. You have to come out and open up. And what I tried to do in my lifetime is not for Pearl, because I don't even know this girl. It's will what I do help Arlene, help the man in the street, help all of us. It isn't a self thing. Thank God I skipped over one thing in my lifetime, and I hope I forever skip over it. It's called selfishness. Oh, boy, you know, very lucky. And I have to tell you, in reading your books and in, in learning about you, you really care about other people. Oh, yes. You care about humanity, you, and you, you're not someone that just talks about it, you do it. But I want to take you all the way back, because Pearl Bailey... Don't go too far, and I keep that age <laughs> level just wavering. Okay. Oh, you know, yeah. you're one of the youngest people I know. Yes. I'm reading your books, and you're making me laugh, and I'm saying she's so smart. <laughs> My God. But Not smart as much as uh, I, I remember a lot. Okay. People said, how do you remember everything? So much, you know how you remember, Arlene? You remember, if I didn't remember 
back to Pottsville, Pennsylvania, and that's in the raw pearl, the beginnings and things, and the first jobs and the $18 and the what. If you didn't remember, how can one go forward when they so cleverly want to never remember the past? The past is what keeps you going forward. Okay, I did read The Raw Pearl, and when you're talking about Pottsville, for those right. people out there who don't know, that's when you started out, that's $15, right. $18 a week that's right. working in really crummy places. Pottsville, yeah, Wilkes, Bear, Scranton, Schoolhaven, you Awful. name it, I was there. Awful cold towns, yes, you know, kind yes. of. But you came, you know, interesting, you were brought up in Washington, D.C., born in Virginia. Yes. You came from a very close-knit family. Um, no, no, yeah, we were close near, but Papa was a preacher, so you, and everybody shouted. That's really what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, but it's interesting because also yeah. your parents separated when yeah. you were very young, yet your family remained very close. You remained very close to your mother and your father. Oh, yeah. They must have been extraordinary people to be very able to strong. keep the family unit very that strong. close. Very strong. And uh, we, we look alike, uh, we even sound alike with the depth of the voice, you know, that has a, a depth. Uh, my father is part Creek Indian. That won't help the Indians cause. I wish somebody would. They should. And, uh, uh, but a part of humanity. That's what my father had. We never learned anything in our family without a parable. If my father said, they're so beautiful, if my father said, go to the store and it looks like rain outside, I don't, I don't uh, get into any subject should I take an umbrella. People say, you must have been pretty tough, because you really would get it. I mean, you'd get it. Not uh, necessarily too much spank, spank, but you might, you would be told off. Now, he had a reason. You said, what a tough man. And those who are listening to you said, gee whiz, he must have been tough on him. No. And I go with my father saying, if it looks like it's rain out, it's going to rain out there, and I want you to go to the store, Arlene. Now, if you don't want to get wet, we said, why, Papa? If you don't want to get wet, take an umbrella. If you don't mind, don't take one, but don't ask me to think for you. So I was raised by a Mama and Papa. I said Mama could charm a snake in the book. Papa had the other kind of wisdom. Both is what, uh, what they would call now, they used to call it mother wit. Think, and I told my children, think for yourself. So many people want Arlene to think for them. You know why? Wow. They don't want the responsibility of thinking because if it comes out right, They'll get the praise. If it comes out wrong, Arlene's going to get it. Think for yourself. Okay. Have you always been that way? Yes. You have. I don't think I've been a change in person at all. People meet me in the street, Arlene, and said, you're just like you are on television. You're like you are. You I don't know any. That's the trouble with people. They're so afraid of them to be themselves. We are so hung up in America today on images. They go to the store, we go to all the markets, you know, I cook, wash, iron, scrub, needlepoint, crochet. It kills me, you're in the market and you're in the line, everybody's busy looking at all the, the papers that said, uh, Arlene, uh, she goes with this guy, and Pearl just went over there and robbed the bank. They're reading the headline. You never read the article. And we're so hung up on the image, and you're not at all, Arlene, like I thought you were. Well, what did I thought you were? Why don't I take you at face value and see? You know, that's interesting. Pearl Bailey really is what you see. In reading yeah. your books, you, you write exactly as, as you talk. Uh, the kind of feeling that, that you give from people on the stage, I think, is very much like the feeling I get from you in person, which yeah, is a lot of love and warmth. But a lot of other things, too. I'm an Aries, so you know, I, I'm a ram. I stand <laughs> on the hill and wait, but it takes a lot to run out the patience. But when it runs out, then I'm, I'm a real ram to turn lion or something. <laughs> But you've got to, it's to be yourself. See, the trouble in the world is, the, people asked me one time, I was in, in Scotland, and someone, they had this interview by 38 it, uh, newspaper people, television, everything. At the end of all this press, the big question was, so what are you the happiest about? And without even thinking, Arlene, and I didn't realize what I was gonna say, I said, to be. See, biblically, you have to be. Most people, and particularly, it's so sad, I was, a lot of our young who want to be in the, uh, in the theater and right away where it's the fame or so forth, how can you become, they want to be before they become. First you got to, to, to how can you be? I got to become like Arlene. Now, how do I become like you? I become through apprenticeship, which is totally lost in America, totally lost. 
we're going to talk about it. And we're going to talk about some other things that you've become too, which is also a poet. You also write poems. Mm -hmm. When we come back, I want to talk some more, and I'd also like you to read one of your poems to us. But we're going to take a commercial break, and then we'll be right back. Okay. You've got to make money. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Girls got to eat. Like you did with your commercials. <laughs> Girls got to eat. That's right. <laughs> we're speaking with Pearl Bailey. We're here at the United States Mission to the United Nations. We'll be right back after these messages. Please don't go away. I'm Arlene Herson, and we are back with the incredible Pearl Bailey. <laughs> and I don't use that term loosely. Hey, you're making me sound so intelligent <laughs> with these books. I better tell you what else I do in the world. <laughs> Some of the things. But we were talking about something very interesting, and that was the images. And I think we should really hit your uh, viewers, and I, well, which we hope are many. I'm one of them, I watch them. But to the image of things, it's, it's like in the theater when we do, you know, I, I do concerts, and we call them concerts now. You know, uh, everybody is, say, like Frank and Sammy and Lena and Eleanor, the concerts now, but in the show business we came from, it was shows. And so now it's one-on-one, on, on one. that's my favorite kind of show business. And that's when it was it. I, oh, I like what's out here now. But I wouldn't tell any of them to go against uh, the, the giants, I call them. And I think the children, the young, not children, they don't like that. They like to be called young adults. But isn't it sad that the people today are thrown out of watching these wonderful people who, uh, if the theaters were only open, they could see what one-on-one -on -one means. We used to have the opening act, the second act, the, the chorus girls, this, and no one would cut up the seats. No one would do that. We have not exposed the young people of the day to what the show business really is all about. Once talking to Bob Hope, we were making a picture, and I said, it used to be show love. Now it's show cold, hard business. And that's a pity, because the young people of the day, we wonder why they go bananas at these things, and they're enjoying, but they're waving their hands and everything. What a pity that they haven't been so exposed to the kind of music where you sit down, you can listen to poor darlings, don't even have a chair now. What a pity. <laughs> Do you think the children of younger people wouldn't come and see Frank Sinatra and sit down or Sammy? They would go crazy over this if we didn't take it away from them. We are doing it. That's interesting. So that when you're on the stage, do you feel different when Pearl Belly does a concert now as opposed to a show? Do you well, it's the same, feel but I meant... You do now, you do your 60 minutes, or 90 minutes, and, and it's you. Uh -huh. How wonderful. Frank and Sammy and Dean are getting ready to do something now. Go around the country uh, on the train or something and do to these cities. Why not? You know what's sad, Arlene? That for years, we, you know, I did that, I can't tell you, in the 60s. And for no reason at all, I'd close Vegas, take the whole show. I had 62 people, the man was paying for me one. Off I went with all these people because I believed in vaudeville. They said, the agents, everybody said, it's dead. I said, it's not dead. But people have a theory. They'll say, oh, Pearl, and my husband, Louis, the great drummer, and they'll say, are you still working? I said, of course. Of course I am. I'll tell you why they asked that. If you're not playing, what, how sad, if you're not playing Chicago, or New York, or Atlantic City, or Vegas. You're not in show business. What do you mean you're not in show business? They have some of the finest looking auditoriums in Canton, Ohio, you have it. Binghamton, New York, I just saw Why can't we go to the people all over? You have fine auditoriums. I'll be at West Point, at the Eisenhower Center. These beautiful places. But why do you have to be in the big cities? What's wrong with the people in the, in the other, what we call little cities? I agree, but I think wherever you see Pearl Bailey, actually, you're in for a real treat. But yeah. you referred, I just want to go back a little bit, because yeah. you can't, you refer to your husband, who's a drummer, That's right. and you refer to the young people, and you have two children. Your husband is, is Louis Belson. The originator in the world of the double bass drum. See, Louis plays two bass drums. So when you see that around, that's Louis. <sighs> and he's all music. That's the best description of all musicians. Ah. 
Now okay. remember, I'm not a musician. Well, that's okay. And they argue that point That's with me. interesting. I would call you a musician. Well, everybody says, well, Pearl, the voice is your first music. That's true. Right. And so why do you say you're not a musician? Because to me, nothing is a musician but a musician. It is, for your viewers, all those who are even musically looking, and for those who don't know this, of all the professions in the whole world, that is the brotherhood of man music and a musician is a musician too there's a have you ever noticed in a band when one does a solo the whole band turns to look at him as if they never heard him before they finish a whole recording thing and when it's over they hug and kiss like in the beginning they never met no one is in intrudes upon the world of music and one day I, uh, I guess I'm more of a philosopher you left that out too <sighs> than anything. I think so, because I think that from a little child, I've always felt this way. And one day, I hear voices too, that's kind of strange too, <laughs> that something said to me, and there's a big if in front of this, every man worships God in his own way, I mean, stones, trees, uh, Allah, you, uh, anyway. And something said to me one day, thinking about musicians, that if their music is their God, then they are the holiest of all men. Because that oneness, doctors have a oneness, but there's a oneness that's almost frightening. It's so beautiful. That's interesting. You feel that oneness. I hear that after all of your shows, you, you have a private moment with God. Talk to nobody else. You want to be alone with God. Is, is that so? I think I meet him before the show, to <laughs> tell you the <laughs> truth. I meet him before, he's always, God is ever present. And I always say, whoever, whatever, and, all, and my father, I told you, was a preacher. No, the thing is, when I get ready, I don't have company in things backstage. We're up here, we're doing, you and I are talking. There's no crowd, you don't see, I don't have an entourage. In fact, there's something written about me once, I hear in a story about an entourage following me. That would be the biggest joke in the world because I'm a loner. I'm never alone, but I'm a loner. No, before I go on, a long time ago, I learned from my first agent, the first man that had an agent. I made $35 a week, $33, and he took 35% of that. I never heard of that, but I was happy, and I did a job up on Post Road somewhere in New York. That, um, I, I don't know, I just feel like I came to do a job. And people don't understand, and I explain it to them. If, you're, if, if your mother goes into the doctor's office, you can't go. She goes alone. I come to do a show, people out front, and I, that is what it is. Dear God, let me go out and do the best I can. When I finish and come in the wing, no one's allowed to stand in the wings. I come off, I got to know, dear God, how did it go? And that's, that's it. That's your company. You ah, got a big crowd there. Pretty good company. <laughs> <laughs> big crowd. Yes. We're going to take another break and we're going to come back and, uh, and talk some more. <laughs> we're speaking with Pearl Bailey. We're here at the U.S. Mission to the United Nations. We'll be right back after these messages. We're back with my very special guest, Pearl Bailey. And the time is going so quick, and there's so much to Pearl Bailey. First of all, before uh, we go any further, I mentioned five books, and I just want to mention yeah. what they are, because they're extraordinary, okay? Mm -hmm. The first, uh, you wrote two autobiographies. Uh, you wrote a, uh, a children's tale, which was just wonderful, called Dewey's Tale, which is mm -hmm. a children's story. You wrote the best cookbook I've ever read because <laughs> it's a wonderful <laughs> story of your life and, and people uh, that you've met. And well, it, the heavy you menu, the heavy recipes now in the cookbook, Bing and, and the Tony Bennett's mother, and they're different ones like they got the fancy, fancy stuff. When you get to the plain stuff, Arlene, that's me. That's why I said the book. I tell everybody in the beginning, this is a book you go to bed with. Now, how do you go to bed with a cookbook? And you know, you what did you do? You got in the bed, you said. There's po poems, how to clean the house, how to raise the children. 
and then you come across one of my simple menus and you get hungry and you get up two o'clock in the morning and you cook. So that's that book. The first one, The Raw Pearl, that's an autobiography. The second is a strange thing in life called Talking to Myself. I perhaps that may, to me, might be the deepest and my favorite because, you know, you live, Arlene, and then the second book becomes, How Did I Do Something? It's a strange thing, I'll put it as quickly as I can. All your life, in the first book, I'm saying you're up on a pedestal in our business as the image again. They're up on that pedestal, and you see this great pedestal. Second book, by the time you've lived a little more, something happens, you're going to find out something, Arlene, and all the people looking at you, you, honey, you're not on a pedestal. You're holding the stem. The others have got themselves up on the pedestal. That's what you have to watch. It's like you and I were talking about famous. How famous can one get? Everybody's looking for fame. I told my daughter, she just incidentally went to the finals, and that's the only part she's lost of Star Search. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Okay. I never even heard her sing. <sighs> you haven't heard her sing? I heard her sing, twi uh, well, twice. Her and I did a little duet together, because I'm push my children into what, let them go out there and work, and, and I'm sure you help them, but let them go out there, your children, and get it. I told my son, Tony, get the job, never mind whether it's 400, 500 a week. Get a working job, get to pay the rent job, get the job that you don't have to lean on others and get out there, get up in the morning, comb your hair and go to work. <sighs> don't stand on the corner. It, you know, in, in your books, See? the advice that you give to your children, yes. both your children are adopted, yes. they are absolutely so lucky to have come into your home, yes. but you give such good advice. Even well, in your you try and then you go from there. My mother and father, in all things, you, you have to put the foundation. And we pray in our lifetime that our children stay on that foundation. Yet, if they fall, and mine have fallen, as all have fallen, every family, if you say, I got five children, I always look at them and say, what do you got, three out of five, two out of one? You tell five something and you wonder how they go wrong. But should they fall from a good foundation, you hope their little fingers are able to grab onto the edge like a sidewalk and hold on. And if you have given them the truth, they will be able to come back up and make it, maybe years later, whatever. You know, uh, interesting, Pearl Bailey, um, you know, I don't think that most people have any idea of all the things that you do. And we have not been able to cover this all in a half an hour. So first of all, I want you to <laughs> promise been that, that, long. <laughs> that you're going to do another show with us and come back next week. Um, when and you, the next. is 52 and, weeks. Oh, okay. Year. No, I, absolutely. <laughs> because what you do, we're at the United Nations. We haven't yes. even talked about what you do here. And you're a world traveler, even on your own. You have yes. been all across the country, yes. uh, the world, not and just across I, the country. Well, not all the world, but uh, the Middle East and, and Africa. But you know what I do when I go there? I, they all say, I've been invited there. This wasn't through the United Nations. This is personal contact. And they would say, would you come to our country? Maybe you some met me. I said, yes. But they've got to have the quartet and EB, the road manager, has to be take off. Oh, we'll tell you on the next Okay, we're going to have to talk week. about the next time. But I next just want to read at the end of your book, okay, you said, in talking to myself, you said, what, what will happen to me when I can't sing and dance? Then I'll do something else. I will do as much of it as I can, and I'll do it as well as I can. Then, you know, I'm not going to read all of it. Then you said, maybe I'll take an actor int interest in politics. Maybe I'll run for president. Now, my goodness gracious, 30 seconds. Would you ever want to run for public office? Uh, uh, politics? Yeah. I don't know about politics. But um, <laughs> as I told them at the UN, and we'll lead and tell you about it next week, I've been by pass and speak to everybody, and they're looking. Don't, and I said, you can speak back on it. This is a smile from the heart. It's not a political <laughs> smile. So you got my answer there. <laughs> okay. Well, whatever Pearl <laughs> Belly does, she does extraordinary. And I thank you for taking the time. We're going to come back next week, and we're going to talk uh, some I'll more. I'll be back. And you got 52 weeks. <laughs> <up. laughs> I hope that you've enjoyed spending some time here with us at the U.S. Mission with this very special person, Pearl Bailey. And I certainly hope that you'll be with us next week because we're going to talk about lots more in her life. Hope to see you then. Good night.
I'm Arlene Herson and I'm glad you can join us tonight because tonight we are going to meet a woman who could be considered a national treasure. One of the foremost and best loved entertainers of our time. She not only captivates the hearts of all those who see her perform, she has also won the hearts of several presidents of the United States. President Nixon named her Ambassador of Love. President Ford honored her with an appointment as a special advisor to the United States Mission to the United Nations. And President Reagan named her public delegate to the 42nd General Assembly of the United Nations. She won a Tony for her role in Hello, Dolly, has written five books, and believes her role here on Earth is to serve humanity. Her autobiography is called Raw Pearl. She is certainly a rare pearl. She is Pearl Bailey, and we'll speak to her right after these messages, so please stay right there. I'm Arlene Herson. We're back. Here we are at the United States Mission to the United Nations with my very special guest, Pearl Bailey, who right here in the midst of this beautiful boardroom is sitting and crocheting. Yes. <gasps> oh, oh, there you are. <laughs> well, I tell you what, I do this at home, and it, it, these are stocking caps, you see. And I, pay, I can walk down the street and give them to children or anybody, their head is cold. In fact, in the UN one day, I don't do this all the time, but after sometimes the 41st speaker, that, that uh, we've been high in three days is 94 people, and you got this thing hung on your ear. So I go underneath here, they tell me Eleanor Roosevelt used to crochet, used to knit, and I'm crocheting. And someone looked across, isn't this something, and said, lady, hat, I never, I hear America, it's cold, and uh, in the winter, I said, yes. I said, kid, I said, what is that? I said, it's a little hat, it keep you warm. May I have a hat? And a strange thing happened. Someone, uh, when I got it finished, uh, and they said, I started to give it to them, someone said, oh, and it was in my delegation. I don't think we are that close with them. I said, darling, this is not a political hat. This is a hat to keep a human being's head warm. And they're gonna have the hat. And I gave it to them. Yeah, that's... And, uh, I had a strange experience, of, I mean, not strange, if, if everybody was trying to get a ticket, I guess, but you know the Gorbachev thing, talking about the UN and all, a strange thing happened at the Gorbachev dinner. Okay, now I, I just want to just lay the groundwork for this because that dinner, yeah. when Gorbachev <laughs> was in town, I, that was the hottest ticket in town for anybody to get. I mean, to be at that dinner, right. on that Tuesday night dinner was very special. Pearl Bailey was there and as Louis. a guest. Okay, and Louie. But I lived in the hotel, uh, Madison, and there were 246 rooms of KGB. Oh Their Secret goodness. Service was, of course, ours was there, too. It's very interesting to go up on the elevator with two of yours and two of theirs and come down. You never moved at all, of course. And you keep in mind, the Russians, uh, Soviets, they like to be called, a lot of them, they don't smile. They don't smile that much. And yet, I went to Russia in 84, Lou and I, and the fellas, and it's so funny, they are some of the warmest people, I'm not talking government now, the warmest people you have ever met in your life. You're walking down the street, Arlene, and all of a sudden, uh, there are people around you, and don't have a little photo, and they like big razors and, and tea, you know, instant tea, instant coffee, hard candy, but they won't ask you for anything. So. But the thing is, being in that hotel made me think about being in, in Moscow, in Leningrad. They're around you, and all of a sudden, there they are, and they're warm, and a man comes up with a hat. And when he comes up with the hat, the, the soldier-like, and looks like to me everybody, every other one is a soldier, he just stands. And they sort of, uh, kind of, you can see the wariness coming in. Then he'll go away, and then a man comes, I call him the Al Capone hat, you know, with his zip down the long gray coat, and he stands, and believe me, suddenly you wonder where did all my friends go? They don't run, they simply mm. move away. So I, I got one thing to say to your listeners. I really think that everybody in America, we get to Gorbachev, it's, relate, it's relating to a relationship between us. I think everybody should almost be forced to take a trip there. Now, we're not all right here in this country. We've proved that over the UN. We're not all wrong either. 
But I think we should all have to go and see the most important thing to me, and it happened in that hotel. I watched some of the people that work there. They, it creates a stiffness in you when you see people around you not smiling. So I pointed my finger, I lived there all the time, I pointed my finger and said, good, you're all learning a lesson, aren't you? You're learning how important it is to live in a country where with all our rightness and our wrongness, at least we are allowed to smile. And that's important. Now, I want to tell you, Gorbachev, before it leaves me, I'm at that age you now, it goes and comes, but most of the time it stays. I was sitting where I could look right at him. And I could see her too. And uh, suddenly there was something, I touched Mr. Wick, who's USIA uh, head of that, and I touched him, and Mrs. Bush was at the table, I said, there's something in this room and there was something in that room. I've been to some of those dinners, and there's a joy, a happiness, but it's a different kind. There was a bubble, almost. And it was, I said, do you feel this, the wick? And he said something. I said, you're darn right it is. It was love. Now, suddenly the president had looked over, and he beckoned me, and I thought, I don't want to go over uh, to there, and I should. He said, go. He did beckon you. I went over, and I kneeled down. I said, sir, I feel something in here. He said, Pearl, I feel something too. I said, him. I meant the love of God. And the Russians, you know, uh, they don't say <laughs> about the God. Yeah. You don't go uh, mm -hmm. holy, holy that much. And not all, because I know people there that do love the Lord. And I meant, uh, he said, I feel it too. There was a feeling, and I know what it was now. Now that it's over. It was a feeling of, at last, two countries that the whole world is tense over, when are we gonna do each other in? At least we touched. Never mind how this treaty, we'll see how that works out. But we touched each other. And who in the world, we never thought, and we've had a, some Russian leaders come, but this particular time in life with the missiles and the bomb, we touched and there was a feeling of, I wonder if it was more hope than even love of, Lord, is it finally going to happen? That is a wonderful story, you know, and you, I think you created for us something that, that we all hoped was happening in that room and, and, and happened and you were there. How She's special. a shrewd cookie, though. Yeah. <laughs> She's pretty shrewd, too. <laughs> okay, well, you have said in, in your books that you can sense mm -hmm. people right away, that yes. you can tell if they're good or bad. Well, some call me clairvoyant. Okay, well, could you tell, you obviously yeah. from him got, got good feelings. Uh, it wasn't a feeling of him as my, oh, he was busy enjoying himself at the table. He was, uh, the, you know, really the, the uh, in fact, I touched Wick later and I said, to tell you the truth, I said, this man is having, I forgot his name by then, I'd forgotten it. And I said, this child is having such a nice time, darling, he may never go home. Well, I'm having such a nice time, yes. I may never remember to take a commercial break, but we have oh, to do that. Well, sweetheart, you got to make a living. <laughs> oh, that's right. We'll take a break. We're speaking with Pearl Bell here at the U.S. Mission. We'll be right back after these messages. I'm Arlene Hurston, and we're back here at the United States Mission speaking with Pearl Bailey. And uh, here we are, as I said, we're at the U.S. Mission uh, to the United Nations, across the street from the United Nations. Now, you spent a lot of time in that building across the street at the United Nations. Now, if the title is right, you're a public delegate to the 42nd yeah. General Assembly of the United Nations. Can you tell us what that means, what you do? Well, most of my time, in fact, all of my time is in plenary, which is in the General Assembly. And I've got that thing hooked on my ear, and I am listening. We all listen. But I spend more time, I think, over there than anyone, because it's the thing that I was here, you see, twice before. This is my third time in. But I'm, in this particular thing, I never move. I go over there at about 10, and a lot of times we're over there until 7, 8 o'clock at night. It has gone as late as 10 or later. Well, when you say that you never no. move, you go over no. to the United Nations, you That's hear right. all, the, all the heads of state speak now. There are two times, I know you moved, yes. two times. Oh, yes. The United States delegate walked out Same. General on Waters the speaker. led us out, and we go with him, and then we, we went out on Ortega and... Uh, and Khomeini. I, and Khomeini. 
But okay. you know what was gorgeous about that? See, I've always got the hat on. This happens to be a uh, hat I got in Makba, in Moscow. But I also move at other times. But I got to tell you about this man speaking from Iran. And it was so cute because I had on my black turban. And he had his turban. And now we were on the front seat. It was marvelous because he was talking, but he kept looking at me. And I wanted, oh my goodness, I've been to Iran. I wonder if this child remembers me. And he's looking, I get, but what I think he was thinking about, she's sitting there with the, the, the American delegation. She's got on this black turban. She must be one of us, but what is she doing there? And I think he was making up his mind half the time about these two turbans. But I moved many times because I can say it on the air. The ladies' room is up that way. So I go up this long aisle, but it's so beautiful. I'll even, I'm closing off my session up there. And I told General Waters, and I would tell anyone, it is not like even leaving over the General Assembly. My husband calls me Mother Earth, and many people do. I feel like I'm leaving, not even my brothers and sisters over there. I feel I'm leaving my children. I feel I need to be there. I go up the aisle, and before I came in here, in traveling, I do brutro, I'll speak to the Russians, Bono Dinamatsa, I'm speaking to the Romanians, they just, you know our language. The uh, Kefalic, this is Arabic, and you go to the Hebrew, you go. I think that we should learn more of languages. At least be able to say, good morning, good evening, I love you, God bless you. And all of them want to be touched. Every person over there wants to be touched. Okay, now you're talking about the people from all, all over the, the world, world in the United Nations. Yes. Now, there's been a lot of controversy over there in oh, recent yes. years. The Americans have not been that popular. No. You are popular. Yes. How, okay, but what's the feeling of, of, of the Americans in the United Nations? Where are we going? Well, I think, number one, my popularity stems from just that. Good morning, hello, friend or enemy. And I speak to people. And that's important. We've got to learn to touch our popularity. Um, I think is is not as large as it is because I think this and and I remember I told you I've been here twice before and I'll be very honest with you, I had a feeling from the very beginning, and it's strong, that these smaller nations all their uh, blocks, and I have a feeling that it's like anything else in this world. I am going to be heard. It's a I'm going to come forth, and it's like me in the theater or the, my life that you've been reading about in these books, or you read last week, you were talking about my books, that the man in the street is the most important thing in the world. A long time ago in show business, I made up a saying, when you're talking about making money, you know, you come, oh, I'm going to make a lot of money. Go Take the twos and fews, remember this, Arlene, take the twos and fews to get to the minis and plenties. So we always have to remember there are more smaller nations out here than larger ones. And so this blend has got to come. And if I may, and I hope you've got a minute and a half, I'll tell you something that will cover this whole thing. Once a country spoke, we answered, and I read the answer. They came back with us with another answer, and I threw up my hands. Uh, to answer as write a reply, and you don't talk in the United Nations without paper. I think I'm the only one that's done it twice, once 11 years ago now. I put my hands up, and this is an answer to all of what we're talking about now. And I said, you know, I have no paper. I don't even have an answer for you, sir, written, but I don't need it. I'm going to talk from here. We come in here in the mornings, and it's true. That's not America. All of us over there, 159 nations. We hug, we kiss, hello, hello, we go on. Then in the evening, half of us hate each other so much, in a sense, we can hardly get out of that building and say good night. Now this is, we need this UN, because, let me finish this part. I said, but let me tell you something. And the hands in there, and everybody's still, because it's not done there. You gotta read, or you don't know, I think. I said, we, in the, between that thing in the morning of love, between that thing in the evening, God has given us the right, like Arlene and Pearl, to argue, debate, don't like your clothes, you don't like my clothes, the whole thing. But God has also said to us, in the evening, at least, you should all be left with the dignity and class to say good night. 
and come back again and fight again, brother. Fight again, sister. That's what it's all about. And that has to happen. That United Nations can be the, and people should know this, that body can be the most constructive body and it is put together for the good of man. We cannot misuse it or it will be destructive. And when it speaks, it should be listened to. And Pearl Bailey should be listened to. And I think if more people over there and throughout the you world listen to you. You gave me two weeks, yeah. I'll be back and we'll hear it. <laughs> okay, we're going to take a break and you'll be back again to tell us some more. Is there, is there more? Yes, there is more. We're speaking with Pearl Bailey. We'll be right back. Please stay right there. <laughs> I'm Arlene Herson, and we're back with my guest, Pearl Bailey, and we're really spending all of this time talking about Pearl Bailey as a diplomat, which is really what you are, and, and your travels all across the world. In the earlier segment, you, you referred yes. to your books, and actually you've written five books, but those were the people that listened to us last week. Yes, <laughs> and, uh, that's right. Because now there's a whole other facet of Pearl Bailey. You were talking about the United Nations. Now, you're here now. Yes. You were also here in 1976. 75, 75 on the morning. Part of the time in the Monaghan under Governor Scranton and now under uh, uh, General Waters. Okay, I would just like to read something that was read into the close of the minutes of the General Assembly, 1975, okay, from the ambassador of Saudi Arabia. He said, thanks to the host country for having delegated Pearl Bailey, who brightened the General Assembly, she is an honor to her country and to humanity at large. I mean, this is in the minutes of the United Nations General Assembly, and you have done so much. I mean, it is impossible to really talk about your whole life, even even in, in two shows, which we've been trying to yes. do, because you've also traveled all yeah, over all the this. world. Now, in 1976, you were, the official title was Special Advisor to the United States Mission to the United Nations. Now, in that role, you traveled all over the world. Your purpose was to visit every hospital, orphanage, mentally retarded, and handicapped institution in the countries that you visited. Well, not in that role. I went that way, Arlene. I went individually. I uh -huh. was not a United Nations in. Uh, for instance, uh, I was in Washington, and I uh, met the Ambassador Salah of Jordan. He said, oh, you must come to our country. And off I went. And I'm now the auntie, of course, to King Hussein and Queen Noah's children. One is born on my birthday. He gets a special present. And uh, Hamza. And then uh, I, I was in Iran and Egypt, but it went, I went that way. And they, they but I had a, they'd say, you come to our country. I said, and then remember, I've been all in Abu Dhabi and all with the wealth. And I said, wait a minute, I know how wealthy you are, but I must come and go with our little quartet. And we didn't take any, the monies. And I paid my fellas, but I paid them myself. We must come there and do something. I don't care how wealthy you are for the children the lepers all, and give like, a, like we do in our country, a concert or something, and whatever wealth you got, get, some, get something for those children. When Madame Jahan Sadat did, uh, was, had about 12 huts, which is Wafa Walama, Faith and Hope, she was going to try to start a place for the handicapped. Well, I helped, helped shovel some of that dirt that we were starting some new buildings with my shovel, and now it's a whole city there. Um, I, when uh, President Sadat first came to this country, they, he came to the White House there, and, and somebody said, but you danced with him. How did you, how'd you get him up? Because they don't, uh, men, body, and women are not touching like we dance. And I said, but we didn't touch. Well, President Ford was sitting there, and I just went by him and did my hand like that. I didn't say anything, and he got up. I was with him on August 8th, 30, uh, August 8th October 8th, he was assassinated in Iran, uh -huh. Egypt, but you got to go. And in Africa, once I had my hand on somebody, and after all this thing, I'd gone to all the hospital. You know, after I got back, somebody said, they were lepers. I didn't go, ooh. And I always look and say, yeah, but my hands are still clean. Thank God. Yeah, because you touched the lepers, and you mentioned You've that. You've got to you touch were there everybody in this world. Of, you know, you, you mentioned uh, President Ford. And yes. I have to say, I have a, um, there are so many books here that Pearl Bailey has. mentioned Betty has Ford while okay. we done. This lady, <laughs> okay. to I, me, ooh, okay. did it all. Yeah, okay, but Pearl Bailey's doing it. Can I read a telegram that uh, 
President Ford sent to you uh, yes. because I was really impressed with this. It was you better on your, read it because I can't okay. see it. <laughs> <laughs> on one of your many, many times to the White House, and President Ford and and uh, and Mrs. Ford uh, have been big fans of you. President Johnson and Lady Bird Johnson came on the stage uh, when you performed in Hello Dolly. We haven't even talked about Hello Dolly. You won the Tony Award. Uh, President Nixon named you Ambassador of Love. Uh, President Reagan has appointed you and invited you. Let me just read this telegram Please very do. quickly from the President of the United States, Gerald Ford. The White House sparkled last night with that special feeling only you can convey. For one very short hour, the room was filled with love and goodwill. The cause of world peace and friendship was given another shot in the arm by our dear Ambassador of Love. Just like a good friend, you were there when we needed you. We will never forget it. You and Louis are terrific and a great team. God bless you both. Gerald Ford, President of the United States. Would you know what happened? I was up in Boston with Dolly. Uh, Mr. Mary, Clo we got it closed for a day. Someone else was supposed to go, and that's when Sadat came. And she called. I was sitting on the floor of my old robe. Can you come down? It was a hang-up. The person didn't, uh, so whatever happened. Can you come? And we went, and that was, that was it. And you're supposed to show up for a friend. Yeah, well, it, it's all you, touching, Arlene. You have been to the White House probably more than almost any other performer, except, uh, Bob except Hope. for Bob Hope. <laughs> okay, for sure. but you're still going. Yeah. You're still going. Yes. And I have to say that that we're we're gone as far as time is concerned. This is absolutely incredible. There but you so promised me 52 weeks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so, so all right. I'll take 38. <laughs> okay, I'll take 52. We'll come back again and again and again with Pearl Bailey Please because do. there is so much to you right. and so much to your life and so much to share and. Thank you for sharing That's it. with me. I really thank you appreciate for it. Allowing me on. Uh, thank you. I hope that you have gotten to enjoy getting to know these moments with Pearl Bailey, to know a little bit about her because there's so much to this incredible. Now, I'm woman. even going to tell you my age. I'm 69. Oh. <laughs> I don't look it, but I don't intend to. <laughs> you don't, and there's so much more happening. <laughs> well, she's truly, as you can see, is, is a wonderful lady, and I hope that you'll join us again. No wrinkles, see? No wrinkles. <laughs> I hope you'll join I us again the next week. You can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'm going to stay here with Pearl Bailey, but please come back again next week. Good night. <laughs> see you then. <laughs> yeah.